time so that all brings them to a powwow and the plot takes over. But one of the themes that kept coming up time and time again was how urban um, native people were considered differently to how both indigenous people were understood in this country by non-indigenous but also by natives themselves with regards to the reservation versus the urban geography. And it made me realize, or what I was thinking about a lot was the way that they were imprisoned almost by how they were understood within the landscape. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could speak somewhat to how Palestinians, just from your observations as a visitor or a tourist, or however you describe on this issue, um, your understanding of, I think Israelis aren't condemned to the land in the same way that Palestinians are, but Palestinians seem to be imprisoned within the landscape that Israel has built around them. And I don't mean that just literally in the sense of the settlements that they build and the roadblocks and the walls and whatever, but I mean in terms of this imaginative geography whereby Palestinians, you know, there's a there's a romanticized, as Nilouz was saying, and other, um, other phenomena whereby Palestinians seem to be condemned to the land in a particular um, aesthetic and a particular historic, like a dehistoricization of how Palestinians are understood. Um, and I think, the reality of the Palestinian situation is that we have over 5.5 million refugees worldwide who actually don't live in that land, many of whom have never visited that land. So how, how are Palestinians simultaneously condemned to the land from which you know, they're exiled from, um, but, but also have no means of returning or no means of understanding? That's a fantastic question. I don't think I, but I think the question is worth more than any answer I could get, actually. Because, uh, no, I mean, the, the idea of being somehow, you, you are turned into a figure in the landscape. Uh, something to be seen uh, from a distance. Uh, have any of you seen, what is this uh, uh, recent TV show about the Jewish family that uh, they return to, uh, to Israel altogether and they decide to go to a Bedouin camp it, it, but it's a kind of theme park. Transparent. Uh, oh. Yes, oh, transparent. transparent. Oh, yes. <laughs> Most brilliant episode in Transparent. Uh, anybody want, I think there you're seeing, and they go for a camel ride. And, and it, I, I felt all this, it really, even on our first visit in 1970, that it, this process had already begun of essentializing uh, the Palestinian in the landscape. and. That postcard, I wish I could find that postcard, with the Bedouin on the camel, middle distance, sand dunes in the far distance, uh, a palm tree shading, my, my typical picturesque formula. And then uh, in the shadow, you can see there's a barbed wire, a coiled barbed wire. The, the, this is, uh, it's partly, it's a, a prison that the Israelis share, and to the extent that they're both fixated on the same place but of course, on one side, it was all the power and money. On the other side, not so much. I mean, for me, the thing that scares me most is I feel like the Palestinians are extinction when we depict them in that way. I mean, my yeah. father's, well, that's the point. I mean, we're bed my father's family are Bedouins, for instance. My grandmother had uh, de like tattoos all over her face, you know, very kind of Bedouin identity. And I don't understand myself as a Bedouin insofar as I don't understand Bedouin lifestyle. I'm an urban person, you know, and, and thinking of it like that, the, the modern Palestinian is, there's no space for the modern Palestinian in the way that the landscape is depicted. There's no space for a Palestinian who understands their return. And I think in doing, in understanding Palestinians, there's this phenomenon that um, has a particular aesthetic and a particular way of life. Um, it makes conversations of return very, very difficult for Palestinians to have because, you know, I, when I was doing field work for my thesis, all the, all the conversations that I were hearing were, when we talk about return, we want to go back to our village. Well, what does return to your village mean? How, you know, if you were largely rural or agrarian, how do you, and you don't have those skills because of the camps and because of everything else and the dispossession, how are you able to understand yourself and what does it mean for you to be a Palestinian? I think this is something that, not just in landscape studies, but in a lot of uh, scholarship this, these days, really overlooks the, the, the metamorphosis of Palestinians into a mod, you know, the modern Palestinian exists, and yet there's no space for him or her or them in the way that we understand right. Palestine as landscape, as um, population, as conflict, you know. Yeah. And I think what the moral of what you're saying is it's not enough to um, see or even interpret the landscape. The point is to change it uh, and, and to uh, do something to intervene in that fantasy, uh, which is very oppressive. Uh, 
I was with, uh, in 2016, another part of our visit was with uh, uh, Sandy Halal uh, and decolonizing architecture in, in Bethlehem. And we went to the Desha uh, refugee camp. And, uh, and of course, decolonizing architecture is also this kind of NGO that is trying to ameliorate the condition of people in the refugee camps by giving them nice schools and, and introducing public spaces. So uh, something more than this constant feeling of being under siege uh, it could be cultivated spatially. And uh, he was describing the difficulty of uh, talking to third generation refugees about uh, the question of what do you want to return to? Uh, and uh, there was this attitude which is reinforced that, well, the place we're staying here, the refugee camp, this is not our home. This is temporary. But now it's temporary for you know, half a century. And so uh, the way Sandy said they finesse this problem is by saying, you have to think of yourself as having two houses. You have the house that you remember and the house that maybe you'll return to, but you also have the house you're in. So you want so you're richer than you think. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as, as a thing to say in a situation, I mean, it, in a way it is a lie. Uh, and we discussed this in some way. But it was also, it was one of those tactical lies that you feel like you have to say something. You're trying to make life better uh, in a place. I, I ran into that also when a, a trip to, um, to Nablus, where it was, being led around by faculty and students from uh, the, the university, uh, not Nablus, we're going to say, um, in the north. Ibram? Not a, no, Nablus, yeah, Nablus. <laughs> and we were looking at uh, a lot of ruins uh, together, and the, it, suddenly this argument broke out between the students and the professors. I was so re reassured, I think, that's great, it's a good sign when the students are willing to contradict their professors. Uh, and the, the argument was, what should we do about these ruins? And the professors were all saying, we have to keep them here. This isn't going to be, uh, we will make it a reproach to the Israelis. This is uh, uh, this terrible thing they've done to us. Uh, and destroyed our beautiful city, all of our soap factories. And the students said, uh, one young woman particularly uh, said, I'm pretty tired of hearing that. I, I think we need to uh, make our condition better. Uh, so I, don't, I, I, I was sort of on the student's side. There. I felt like they were fetishizing their own ruination. Uh, and the, you know, the, the dream of return, I, it, it's, uh, I don't think return in any literal sense is going to happen. So I've been trying to think of utopian uh, proposals. I, I tried one out last winter and immediately was accused of being uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, I've shared this with, with Lila uh, after we go here, Brahim's daughter. Uh, I didn't get actually hear what you said. You said you had a, you had a scheme. I have, I have a scheme. We were yet to so what, what would be the great uh, solution to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict? And my, my answer is monarchy. <laughs> I know, it sounds um, absurd, uh, but there should be a king, or preferably, I think a queen, uh, who by law have to be of Jewish descent. There will be a royal family, uh, but they will have no political power. They will, however, occupy, like the Queen of England, uh, the role of sovereignty, so you'll be able to say, this is a Jewish state. Same way you can say that the Church of England is the official church uh, of England. And, uh, but then there will be a parliament, and there will be an actually existing democracy in the Middle East uh, called Israel-Palestine, where anybody could be prime minister and be head of government. Uh, we already so. had it. <laughs> <laughs> and the British crown. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but you were at the outskirts of the empire. I'm talking about making it at the center, so the yeah. Jewish monarchy, I think. Uh, would, would allow the Jews to be those magnanimous conquerors 
that they, my hotel keeper hoped for back in 1970. Yeah. I, I thank you again for a fascinating uh, talk. I, uh, you mentioned Simon Chama's book in your talk, and uh, I, I actually haven't read that book in probably uh, 14 years, but it was in Greek thought and literature at the University of Chicago of my freshman year, and I fell in love with it. I'm one of the reasons I, 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 I'm, one of the things I drew from that book uh, was something about the, the um, relationship between landscape and text, uh, and, and sort of the, the ways we interpret landscapes through texts and text through landscapes. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking about that as you were talking about not knowing Arabic and not knowing Hebrew and not being able to be an expert in this particular land, landscape. But then you bring all these other texts uh, in, you know, and, and not even texts that are local to Israel-Palestine into the interpretation of, of uh, what you're seeing. And you know, I, I don't necessarily want to uh, push back too much on your own characterization of yourself as a tourist or a non-expert or what have you. But I, you know, I, I wonder what you see as you know the the, the application of text to the landscape in Israel Palestine, and how that helps us, you know, interpret it, understand all of these problems, etc. Well, so many different kinds of texts have been applied uh, over the years, going back to the Middle Ages. Uh, so, and. It has been an obsession of Europe for, you know, since Europe became conscious of itself as uh, what the, the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, it, so texts have always been part of it. And the reason I uh, single out that great uh, 1998 conference uh, was because it showed uh, just how many kinds of thinking uh, disciplinary knowledge, uh, historical knowledge, and, and theoretical re reflection uh, could be brought to this place, which is, in some sense, the mythic center of our world. Uh, it, it really is, um, it, it's just a brute fact of our, our species that the three religions of the book, uh, through whatever uh, complex series of causes, settled on this holy land as their common place, uh, but their common contested place. It's ours. It belongs to us and not to them. Uh, so, and these are the religions of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a very important part of it, uh, that they are all religions that re re renounce idolatry systematically. They all share one commandment, the second. The, the other commandments, don't, thou shalt not kill, don't commit, and commit adultery, all of that, that's all, everybody knew that. But when the uh, God's law is delivered on Mount Sinai, the one law that is really we weird, uh, to, nobody has ever been able to understand is the law, it says, thou shalt not erect any graven images of anything. Now, and of course that law has never been obeyed by any of those religions. And yet they're willing to kill people in the name of it. Uh, so to me, it, it, uh, there's a great book uh, called Idolatry by Moshe Halbertal and Abishai Marguerite that I recommend. And they are the ones, uh, is an Israeli philosopher and a, a rabbi collaborating on the history of idolatry. And they said, what really is the secret of the second commandment? What's it about? And the secret is there in numbers, that passage I read aloud. When you uh, enter into the promised land, drive out the inhabitants, destroy their high places, get rid of their graven idols. Because those are not just religious objects for them, they are also claims to the land. They are, and that's why uh, uh, another of Mickey Kratzman's photos, let's see if I can find it, I think is so Fascinating in this respect. Where is it? It's the one of a tin can uh, in the desert, and it's a, a, a Bedouin marker of a, of a disappeared village. Yeah, here, oh, there it is. As you know, the Bedouins are being removed uh, from all 
uh, places <coughs> rationale is, well, of course, Bedouins are always on the move, aren't they? Uh, they are nomads, aren't they? And so well, what does it matter if we push them out? Because we would actually ha like to have this land. Uh, and uh, the Bedouins keep coming back to the same place. Al Weizmann has used a combination of kite photography and Royal Air Force photography to show that Bedouin encampments go back before 48. That they've been uh, staying in the same place for uh, a very, very long time. So this whole Orientalist view of them as nomads who are not attached to any place, totally wrong. And that's why the commandment in Numbers is drive out the inhabitants, get rid of their idols. So this is, the Bedouins left this as a marker to remind themselves, okay, this is where our encampment really is in the Sinai, and, uh, and so we'll return to it. Uh, that's what um, in the 19th century they would have called a Balaam, uh, a god of the place, genius loci, uh, but a very humble little uh, uh, little marker. So th th these things, are, you can see why I'm, I'm a tourist, but I, I know some shit. <laughs> <laughs> said in the beginning of your talk that if you knew the secret of um, uh, Palestinian persistence, you wouldn't say it even if you knew it. Mm. But I'm going to say it. <laughs> You're going to say it. I'm going to say it. Okay, go ahead. Say it. Um, it's, if you want to be great at something, find yourself a for formidable opponent, is the classic <laughs> thing. That, um, I mean, it applies for, I think, for both sides. I think Israelis need the Palestinians to be the way they are, and Palestinians need Israelis to be. They just have to fix a few things, <laughs> and then yes. they will be just great. Yeah. I think this is the, uh, this is the, in my mind, it's the um, ideal solution. Mm -hmm. Is that um, keep them as opponents, but uh, just remove the, all the garbage that comes along with hatred and all this thing. Mm -hmm. You just get rid of the hatred and just keep that, get that strength from the opposition and then use it to make something great. Yeah. I think it's, it's what the, the only way out, I think. Yeah. Well, that was another thing that made me filled with hope in 1998 was the fact that uh, uh, Israelis were there. M more recently, if you read uh, a critical inquiry. I recommend our winter issue for the last winter. It includes a dossier of uh, five or six essays by young Israeli academics, uh, one journalist and the rest are academics. And the question they raised uh, was, what does it mean for Israelis to study the occupation? Very risky subject for them to take on, to be critical about the process of studying the history of their own conquest. Uh, and occupation, uh, and of course, they're not making a career move within the Israeli Academy by do doing this. Uh, this is Ariel Handel and his uh, his colleagues, and I really uh, I, I admired their courage. I, I mean, they're taking a big risk. Of, uh, you know, they may never get tenure as a result of uh, of this gesture, but the essays are marvelous. But the reason they had to send them to us is because they couldn't go to Ramallah for uh, a, a conference on the occupation. The time has passed when, alas, uh, Palestinians and Israeli academics can get together. This is the one thing that always made me feel like the boycott was too complicated for me to comprehend. I still don't. I'm, I, I've made my choice taken my side, but uh, I still have doubts. Yes, one more question. Hi. Um, so I had a question about this thing that you referenced kind of earlier in your talk um, when you talked about Mark Twain and the idea that, like, you know, Western travelers in particular going, you know, to Palestine and, and sort of this, like, literary genre of the travel log, you know, that has sort of like gone through successive iterations, like it's gone through film, it's gone through journalism, like it's this very common story of 
I mean, outsider coming in, and then, you know, I, and I think what's, I, I guess I didn't quite get is the role that that outsider plays when they go back to where they came from, and the role that they play as sort of um, a communicator of, like, what they've observed. So I think on the question of, like, the landscape, or thinking of something like the landscape painting, like, something's always framed in and something's always framed out. And I think that, like, you know, there's something that happens when you frame in an anecdote about a young Palestinian teenager, like, saying he wants to kill a Jew, or, like, a settler smoking weed with, like, uh, you know, someone they encounter. I think, I think because in part it, it sort of contributes to that mystification of the sort of structural condition and the fact that, you know, this answer of why is the land something people obsess about, to me at least, is because it's an issue of settler colonialism and that's, that's always fundamentally about land. That's what, ma that's what particularizes it in the context of other structures of oppression, like colonization. Um, and to that same end of this sort of role of the traveler as ambassador, I think it also raises a question of um, being so vocal about the doubts you have about BDS when I think it's irresponsible in the context of also not sort of giving voice to the particular reasons that Palestinian civil society has called for the boycott and how that makes it something that isn't something that the international community is coming to a consensus on and doing independently. It's something that's done as a response to a call. So I was wondering if you could maybe, I guess, speak yeah, to that. Yeah, well, I hope, I mean, of course, any frame you take is going to leave something out. And uh, yeah, so that's my only excuse for, for that. And uh, as I've said, uh, their settler colonialism is, I think you're right, absolutely fundamental to the, the kind of deep factual structure of, uh, uh, of conditions there. Uh, th th and, you know, I come from the Western United States where we, uh, we had a fresh memory in the, the state of Nevada of, of settler colonialism. My best friend when I was 13 years old was a, uh, uh, a Paiute Indian uh, uh, from the reservation outside of town. And it was the, the first encounter I ever had with, uh, with racism was uh, my friend Andy Gotelli and I are, are with Leroy and his older brother, who we all hated, you know, younger brothers always hate their older brothers. Uh, older brother says, what, what are you guys doing hanging around with that redskin? What? What are you talking about? Uh, you know, it was like this moment of um, realizing the world is a much darker place than you think. Uh, the anecdotes I gave you, uh, you know, plenty of other anecdotes. You know, it, 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 it could go on uh, indefinitely. But I take your point. I mean, I, uh, I agree that um, the fundamental injustice and the, the terrible inequality, uh, the kind of locking of a people uh, into this impossible open air prison, which they love and want to defend, it's, uh, it's an intensified, it's a unique situation that intensifies something that's happened in a lot of other places in the, on the planet. Uh, in New Zealand and Australia, for instance, that's where I started, basically. Thinking about um, the British Empire, uh, Richard the Lionhearted needing to conquer the Holy Land, and Captain Cook going out to the South Pacific. Uh, and now we're in a, a very late stage of this whole process. I don't know if our species is going to make it through. It's, you know, we. The, we're at a big crisis point in this country. Uh, the uh, conditions in Palestine are about as bad as they've ever been. I mean, they, that's why, in telling this story, I was not telling a story with a happy ending, necessarily, except for my fantasy about the monarchy. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 I take your point. Uh, I, and I, um, I, I don't want you to think I underestimate what uh, what the Palestinians are faced with, and and people who are in solidarity with them, as I feel I am, uh, and, and especially now that I, you know, since I'm a, in the in the employ of Hamas, I feel like you know, at least I have some street cred as a uh, uh, you know a fellow 
traveler in this. So it, it, the only thing, all I'm saying is that at a, as a personal matter, uh, it, it, the kind of um, touristic experiences that I've had and the personal experiences of visiting this place and seeing how people cope with things that I couldn't imagine uh, coping with. Uh, Tina Sherwell, the head of the, uh, uh, the uh, International Art Academy of Palestine in Ramallah, uh, commutes from Jerusalem on a daily basis. Uh, it, it, her description of her day, that was enough for me. How do you put up with it? You have to go by the uh, Kalandia checkpoint every day. And is treated like shit every day. So I don't emphasize it, and I could tell you other stories about a trip to that trip to Nablus. Uh, yeah, I see we're running out of time. Uh, so, but I, I won't tell you any more stories. But let's say one last question, and then. Yes, um, appreciate the monarchy fantasy. <laughs> uh, however, I don't want to rob you of that fantasy. Uh, but uh, about 25 years ago. Uh, one of the leaders of the religious settlers, colonialists in the West Bank, published a very short article in Haaretz, and I kept it from our archives. Um, I should have paid more attention to it back then. Um, I'm paying more attention to it now, especially after the short civil war that took place in Gaza and the West Bank that you, that, that you mentioned. Yeah. He said something very simple. He said, let everybody focus all their attention and resources on creating a one-state solution or a two-state solution. We are working on a four-state solution. Two Palestinian states divided between Gaza and, Pal and uh, the West Bank, one secular Israeli state and one religious Jewish state in the West Bank. With different territories? Four different territories. <laughs> yes. And so far, his prediction has come closest to what's happening in reality than anybody else that I've heard so far. Yeah. I, we already have three separate territories. Yeah. And the fourth one is about to materialize. Well, we actually entered that fourth space uh, in 1998. Uh, it was the most disturbing Thing I think I've, I've ever experienced, it. you know, getting stopped by the, uh, the the army on a road was relatively child's play. This was uh, uh, Edward Said and Bra Brahim Abulago sitting in the front seat, me in the back seat. We got lost in Jerusalem and found ourselves in an ultra orthodox neighborhood. Yes, yes. So Brahim turned around and said, "Tom, uh, roll down the window and ask these kids." Uh, how do we get to the highway uh, to, to Tel Aviv? Mm -hmm. And uh, is it, if, if I roll down the window, they'll, they'll throw rocks at us immediately. Right. So <laughs> I roll down the window and say, hey kids, you know, my <laughs> best kind of naive American accent. <laughs> and they look at me and I see this look of terror mm -hmm. on their faces and they start to pick up rocks. <laughs> and and say, you know, good try, Tom. Let's get the hell out of here. We, yeah. we just drove around uh, yeah. until we found our way out. Yeah. But that was the fourth space. Same, same thing happened to me. I made a wrong turn, and I, I was raised and born in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, one of my sisters lives in a settlement, and I do have to visit her every now and then. Yeah. Um, and I've been here. I've been hearing, you know, Israel Palestine for the past two days here. I, I just want to just say that to basically think that there is one Israel is a big mistake. Mm -hmm. I think there are several Israels yeah. uh, going on all at the same time, yeah. uh, including a large percentage of Mizrahi Jews who can trace their ancestry back 10 or 12 or 14 uh, generations in Palestine and in Gaza, like my family. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't have a place to go to either, yeah. right? Uh, but on one of my visits, I made a wrong turn, and I found myself in a religious Jewish yeah. uh, neighborhood, and I couldn't get out. Yeah. So I had to leave my car. I was 
stone. Uh, this is this is this is this is the reality over there. Yeah. Yeah. So, what they are doing, and what they have been doing for the past 20 years, according to that master plan, is they educate the men to go into the military, which they avoided for decades, and their aim is to take hold of the central command. In other words, to educate as many religious uh, men to, to uh, advance in the military and hold positions that are strategically important for when that fourth phase uh, comes into reality. And so what we're predicting is that something like that will happen in the next 10 years. Well, that's a very gloomy place to end. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs>